Hello again, everyone. This is Sarah Ostman. I am the Communications Manager in the American Library Association's Public Programs Office. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Tools for Naming and Framing Public Issues. This is part of the Naming and Framing Public Issues series created by the Center for Civic Life and the David Matthews Center for Civic Life. First, a quick logistical note for anyone who is just coming in. If you look at the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a few items that are available for download during today's webinar. There's a step-by-step -step naming and framing guide, bios for our presenters, and a list of other links that you might find helpful. If you want to download, just click on the, the row and then click Download Files. By the way, these handouts were also attached to the two email, email reminders you should have received yesterday and today, so if you printed those out, there's no need to download them again. I would now like to introduce Nancy Cronick. Nancy is lecturer at the Rutgers University School of Communication and Information, and she is the founder and convener of the ALA Center for Civic Life, and she will lead today's presentation. Thanks again for joining us, and I'll turn it over to Nancy. Sarah, joining us today and on the archive version of this webinar. This webinar is the second in a series we are sponsoring about naming and framing public issues. Through naming and framing, we capture the shared concerns of citizens. And we define a problem in public terms, terms that are meaningful to citizens. This is the seventh webinar that the ALA Center for Civic Life has hosted over the past two years all of which have been produced by the ALA Public Programs Office. We're pleased to have their involvement with these efforts. They've archived all of the past webinars on their site. This one will be added shortly after our presentation today. So I want to give you an overview of our naming and framing we webinar initiative. Our first webinar held October 14th, entitled Beyond Deadlock, A Better Way to Talk About Difficult Issues, is now archived and available for viewing. That webinar was intended to inform participants about better ways to help people work together to talk about public issues and make choices, and to uncover the deeper concerns of our communities by listening to people reveal what really matters to them. Today, for our second webinar in this series, Tools for Naming and Framing Public Issues, we're going to focus on applying tools to develop issue maps that help people weigh options for moving forward together. The ALA Center for Civic Life promotes community engagement and fosters public deliberation through libraries. We're delighted that we're joined by the David Matthews Center for Public Life in Montevallo, Alabama, in presenting this series of webinars to you. The David Matthews Center fosters infrastructure, habits, and capacities for more effective civic engagement and innovative decision making. They do amazing work facilitating public dialogue. They've worked with the Birmingham, Alabama Public Library and Alabama Public Broadcasting on various initiatives, some of which we'll hear more about during this series of webinars. So here's some tips about interacting with us during the webinar. Only our speakers will have the mics. You can interact with us at any time, though, through typing into the chat box um, in the bottom right-hand corner. We'll either respond after your comments or wait until the end when we'll do a Q&A. In the meantime, if you haven't already, we'd like you to get familiar with the system and with each other by typing into the chat box your name and where you're located. So let me review what we covered in our first webinar in October of this year. Remember, you can listen to and watch that webinar by going to the ALA Programming Librarian site and clicking on the webinar archive. First, we defined naming and framing for deliberation. Then we highlighted public problems most suitable for naming and framing for deliberation, problems that we call wicked problems. And finally, we identified public spaces most suitable for naming and framing activities. Keep in mind, in the words of David Matthews, who's president of the Kettering Foundation, 
who finds a problem and the name it is given determine the number of people who will be available to solve it and the kind of response that will emerge. So here's an overview of our discussion today. Different speakers will lead each section. We will introduce them at each stage. You can also learn more about them by reviewing the biographical information that's available for download from this webinar and on our ALA Connect site, where all related information is also available, including a list of links and additional resources. We also have available for you today those two documents that Sarah mentioned. One is that step-by-step, one-page summary outlining how to name and frame public issues. That's a one-pager that really just summarizes what we're talking about today. And then a set of relevant links for you. So we'll start the web webinar by hearing from a colleague from the David Matthews Center, Kristen Foster, who will talk about the naming component of naming and framing. Next, Carolyn K. Wood from the ALA Center for Civic Life will share an example of a naming experience in her community, followed by Chris McCauley of the David Matthews Center picking up the topic of framing public issues. Finally, Robert Turner, also from the David Matthews Center in Alabama, will talk about testing the framework developed with these tools. So now let me turn over the mic to Kristen Foster, who's the Program Director at the David Matthews Center for Civic Life in Montevallo, Alabama. Kristen? Thank you, Nancy, and good afternoon. As Nancy said, I'm Kristen Foster, Program Director with the David Matthews Center for Civic Life. During this portion of the webinar, we're going to talk through key components of naming issues for deliberation. Later on in the webinar, Matthew Center Executive Director Chris McCauley will talk through key components of framing issues for deliberation. Naming issues for deliberation captures the shared concerns of citizens. It defines a problem in public terms, terms that are meaningful to citizens. This goes beyond simply using accessible language to closely listening to how the public talks about a problem and using the terms they use to describe the problem. The public's description of a problem may differ from the way experts and public policymakers name the issue. So it is important to listen actively to understand what citizens hold valuable, what they care deeply about. The key question in naming is, what concerns you about this issue? When we name issues for deliberation, we gather the concerns of citizens related to an issue and identify how they define and talk about a problem. The practices that we are describing today help us to develop a deliberative framework, often called an issue guide or issue map or choice work guide. Deliberative frameworks vary in length and layout, but often they include many of the same characteristics. Specifically, effective frameworks should reflect what people hold valuable, both in the name and in the approaches. They recognize citizens as actors rather than passive recipients or bystanders. An effective deliberative framework presents each approach with its best foot forward and raises tensions, trade-offs, and potential consequences clearly and authentically. Naming and framing help us to ensure that these characteristics are included in a deliberative framework. Let's now explore five key components of naming an issue for deliberation. To begin naming an issue, you first want to identify the issue by engaging diverse participants. In naming and framing an issue for deliberation, it is essential to engage diverse participation. You want to hear as many perspectives as possible. To ensure you are hearing from as many voices in the community as possible, you want to go where people are talking about the issue. This can be anywhere from public meetings to grocery store lines, from conversations in the library to chatting with neighbors at a community barbecue. Regardless of where you hear citizens talking about the issue, you'll want to listen carefully to how they talk about the issue. You want to particularly listen for what they hold valuable. What are their, their concerns? What do they care deeply about? You can also engage diverse participation in intentional, more structured naming sessions. These sessions can last anywhere from a day-long meeting to several sessions over the course of many months. And Robert Turner will explore what some of those sessions look like later on in the webinar. Regardless of the length of time dedicated to the naming process, it is important to engage diverse perspectives throughout. One of the greatest challenges in this work can be engaging a diverse group of citizens. 
One way the Matthews Center has been able to address that challenge is by partnering with organizations, institutions, and individuals who can connect with citizens across an entire community. For example, in addition to connecting with the library, local government, or other institutions in your community, you may also want to consider partnering with groups who are more broadly connected within the community to recruit diverse participation. For example, you might want to consider including neighborhood associations, civic groups, faith-based communities, and other more informal groups in the community. Once you have a diverse group of citizens, it is important to begin naming by establishing a knowledge base with participants. It's important to provide strategic facts from a reliable source for participants to examine up front. For example, if you're naming the dropout issue, you would want to provide information from the Department of Education or a local school board on the dropout rate in your community, county, or state. Also, information about how dropout is defined would be helpful. For example, Alabama had recently adopted the four-year cohort, cohort definition of high school completion when we began a series of dropout forums several years ago. Libraries are also excellent places to find reliable information. Participants will also need to examine the impact of the issue on their community or state. With the dropout issue, you may want to provide reliable information about dropout's effect on the economy and public safety, for example. You then want to provide an opportunity for citizens to reflect on their personal experiences with the issue. Strategic facts and community impact of an issue are important, but connecting to the personal experiences and personal stake of citizens is vital to effectively name an issue in public terms. Reflections on personal experiences help you identify what citizens hold deeply valuable in relation to an issue and get at what is at the heart of the problem for them. To get citizens thinking through their personal stake, what is valuable to them and their experiences related to an issue, you can ask questions like, when you think about this problem, what worries or bothers you? What concerns you personally about this issue in your community? As citizens share concerns, you'll want to capture their thoughts on flip chart paper or project them on a screen so everyone can see. The photos on the right-hand side of your slide are from actual naming and framing sessions with young people in Montevallo, Alabama. The students that participated in this naming and framing session named and framed an issue guide on strengthening Montevallo's future. Since it is important to have a range of perspectives in the room when you're naming an issue, you will want to ask questions to get participants thinking about the concerns of their neighbors and others in the community who may not be in the room. Two really good questions to identify the concerns of others are, what concerns do you hear friends and neighbors talking about related to this issue? Who is not in this room and what might their concerns be? Further questions to get folks thinking about the impact of a problem from the perspectives of others are, when you think about this issue, which people are directly affected by it? Which people are indirectly affected by it? And what might their concerns be? These questions help communities get at the heart of what makes the issue real for them. Here's an example of a list of concerns that emerged during a naming session on the bullying issue where we asked questions just like the ones we highlighted on the previous slides. Here is that same list of concerns typed up so that you can see it better. We'll come back to this list of concerns when we begin exploring framing later on in the webinar. The most important role of a facilitator during a naming and framing session is to actively listen. The following questions can help you actively listen and capture concerns during the naming. You want to ask yourself, how do citizens understand the problem? How do people talk about the problem? What connections are citizens making? What do people hold valuable? And are there different points of view not represented here? Finally. It is vital for you to take time to reflect during and after naming the issue. This reflection will ensure that what you are recording and how you are naming the problem accurately captures what the public cares about and is concerned with. The following questions can help us accurately capture the concerns of citizens and avoid inserting our own opinions. You can ask yourself, did I capture people, what people are really saying concerns them? Did we actively listen to make sure we're in sync with people in our community? Does the name of the problem capture what is of concern to people? And finally, are we using the language the public is using to identify the problem? Now that we've talked through the key components of naming issues for deliberation 
and some of the questions we can use to identify the concerns of citizens. We're ready to talk about how we frame an issue for deliberation once it's been named by citizens. But first, we want to highlight what happens when citizens are engaged on an issue that has not been named in public terms. Please over to Carolyn Kaywood from the Virginia Beach Library, who will share a brief story with you. Carolyn, take it away. Hi, I'm Carolyn Kaywood. I'm a retired librarian, and I want to tell you about a naming and framing experience we had in Virginia Beach, Virginia. A referendum to establish a redevelopment authority in Virginia Beach failed because of tensions between various land uses and suspicions about political motives. But city officials and private developers still wanted to change obsolete land uses. And our city manager believed that this was a public problem suitable for deliberation. So a team of city staff, including several librarians, were assigned to do civic engagement about redevelopment. We began knowing that we needed to name and frame the issue in the public's words. We collected concerns from every demographic anyone could suggest and clustered similar comments together. But through all this, we assumed that we were framing the public's concerns about land use, that we were going to have options reflecting different visions of how land would be redeveloped, suburban sprawl, urban density, rural preservation, that sort of thing. When we tested a draft of that sort of framework, we got a resounding no. We discovered that the name of the real problem wasn't how do we use the land, it was who do we trust to decide. Rather than a land use template for experts to apply, citizens wanted to ensure that a balance of voices would be heard before each decision. Using that feedback, we developed a framework that focused on the actions and consequences of putting trust in market forces, in municipal planning experts, and in the citizens directly. This framing structured productive discussions that gave the city government direction. Commitments to long neglected communities are being honored with water and sewer lines. A nature preserve has replaced condos that were on the drawing board. Now, neither land use will generate as much wealth or tax revenue as other uses might, but they reflect what the citizens hold more valuable. Next, Chris McCauley will help us uh, begin to explore Frankative Director of the David Matthews Center for Civic Life. Thank you, Carolyn. Throughout the next series of slides, I will highlight strategies and steps related to framing an issue for public deliberation. The practice of framing is flexible, so these steps are not set in stone. That being said, the information and activities presented on the next few slides are designed to give you a real sense of the practice. As we discussed in webinar number one in this series, framing involves clarifying a range of positions surrounding an issue so that citizens can better decide what to do. When examining and deliberating on wicked public issues, we know that multiple options must be considered, and we know that there is no single, clear, scientific solution available. When framing, often three to four unique approaches emerge that include actions and consequences to consider. The approaches help citizens answer the question, what should we do about this problem? Let's explore how approaches are framed. Earlier in the webinar, we reviewed a list of concerns gathered during a naming and framing workshop on bullying. Using the list, we can now begin to cluster the concerns according to things held valuable. In other words, we can cluster concerns together according to what people deeply care about. Our next few slides will help us illustrate this practice. When clustering, we can start the practice by identifying one concern that was listed. For this activity, we have selected concern number one and highlighted it in orange. The concern states fear of safety for victims. 
Let's take a moment and review the rest of the list and see if we can identify together any other concerns that connect with what this participant deeply cares about. After further review, it appears that concerns 4, 7, 9, and 13 connect with concern number 1. Let's look at why this is the case. On this slide, we have compiled our list of common concerns highlighted in orange. As you can see, we've also listed the thing commonly held valuable in connection to this cluster. For the individuals that shared these concerns, it's apparent that they commonly care about addressing bullying behavior and protecting the victim. In recognizing this theme, we can now create a title for the approach. And knowing that some people at our naming and framing session, and hopefully throughout the entire community, are concerned about correcting the behavior and protecting victims and possible victims, we may frame an approach entitled Get Tough on Bullying to reflect those common concerns. The title must reflect how the public talks about the issue, so it's necessary to spend time examining the title with the participants. As we said earlier, these concerns were collected at a real naming and framing workshop in Alabama. Also, the approach titles are the actual titles that we used in our issue book on the bullying issue. With that in mind, let's continue clustering and explore a few interactive activities. I should note that we will be jumping back and forth between, between steps one and two during our next few slides. We want to highlight the clustering practice accurately, so it will require some creativity. So, back to our list of concerns. As we can see, our orange cluster is still highlighted, and we've now highlighted concern number two in green. Concern number two states, lack of education and awareness among school staff. Let's try to identify a few other concerns that seem to connect with what this person holds valuable. It's some great responses, and after a quick review, it appears that concerns, which some of these concerns were listed in our chat box, concerns 5, 8, 11, and 14 cluster nicely with number 2. Let's look at why. Here, we see the cluster presented in a clear table, much like our last cluster. However, under thing held valuable, we have listed a question mark. At this time, we'd like to encourage everyone participating in the webinar to review the list and to try to identify the common thing that you think that these participants seem to care about. If you're able to identify what they hold valuable, please share it in the chat box. We'll give you a minute or so to participate in this activity. Wonderful. Several response, responses are very similar to the thing held valuable that we identified during our naming and framing workshop. As we can see, folks listed training and education, among many other things. So let's now take a look at what we identified. While working to cluster our second set of concerns, we determined that participants commonly cared about increasing capacity and better understanding the issue very similar to some of the, the language shared in our chat box just now. Building on this theme, we at the Matthew Center went on to title the approach, Equip Students to Address Bullying. Once again, the approach title should reflect the thing held valuable and use terms that reflect how the public talks about the issue. Back to our list of concerns. As you can see, the remaining concerns have been highlighted in purple. Specifically, concerns 3, 6, 10, 12, and 15 are highlighted. Let's further examine this cluster. We can now see the third cluster of concerns presented in an organized table. 
Take a brief mute moment to review up the cluster. Now, in the chat box, list out the thing commonly held valuable by the participants that share these concerns. We'll give you a minute to list those in the chat box. Okay, great. So we're seeing many phrases that say community education, community engagement. So with that in mind, let's now take another minute to try and author a title for the approach, a title that reflects public terms rather than expert terms. We'll give you a moment to respond in the, in the chat box. So once again, how would you, what title would you give this approach considering the thing that these folks commonly care about? We've got a lot of great responses so far, such as stop bullying everywhere, engage the whole community, bullying affects us all, educating the public and community about bullying. Let's now compare what you submitted with the Matthew Center's work. As we reviewed the cluster, we identified that the participants commonly cared about addressing the issue outside of the classroom and involving everyone. Building on this theme, we at the Matthew Center developed a title for the approach that reflects the thing held valuable. That title is Engage the Community and Parents in Bullying Solutions. How does this compare to your suggestions? As we look over our chat box, many folks shared similar language. We also saw a question that emerged asking if the thing held valuable is identified with the group that's naming and framing the issue. Absolutely. This is something that you certainly want to identify with the group that's working to name and frame. So, it looks as if we have many similarities. Also, a few new ideas have emerged during this exercise. This helps highlight the flexible nature of the framing practice. Thank you for contributing to the, these exercises. We have a few more to go. Moving forward, I want to take a moment to look at our emerging approaches in a single clear table. As you can see, we have three unique approaches that we've identified through the steps that have been taken thus far. Again, these approaches help us to answer what should we do about this issue. They reflect what people care about, and they must be treated with equal weight. No approach should be presented as more right or more wrong. Instead, the approaches should highlight what people care about, as well as possible actions, trade-offs, and tensions. Before talking through the final steps of framing, Let's quickly talk about the title of our framework. As we continue to frame the approaches, we must also remember that our framework needs a title. Often, the approaches will connect nicely with the title and that they are designed to answer the question, what are we going to do about the problem? During the naming steps, we must actively work to name the issue in public terms. As we learned from Carolyn, sometimes we have to revisit the name and make sure that we are accurately reflecting the concerns of citizens. The same idea applies to creating a title for the framework and or issue book. When developing the title, be sure to ask if it accurately reflects the concerns of citizens and if it does not, revise accordingly. In the case of bullying, citizens consistently used the term bullying while naming and framing, so the name of the issue didn't change. That being said, had the group used the phrase youth violence or another variation, it would have been necessary for us to reconsider the name. Also, when developing the title, it can be helpful to use a problem statement and or question. With bullying, after naming the problem and framing the approaches, we realized that people were often working to understand the definition of bullying as well as talking about ways to address the behavior. As a result, the framework title that emerged was bullying, what is it, how do we prevent it? You can see the cover of that issue book right there to the right on our 
current slide. As we continue to talk about framing, you will see that each approach works to answer that question. On this slide, we see the progression of approach one. As we further frame the approach with citizens, we must work to identify real possible actions that need to be examined and considered. In order to identify these possible actions, it's helpful to ask people to answer, what are we going to do about it, in relation to each approach. For the Get Tough on Bullying approach, we know that the action ideas will focus on strict consequences and punishment. That being said, it's up to the citizens that are helping to frame the issue to identify actions that make sense in their community. During your naming and framing activities, work with the participants and make a list of actions. As the list emerges, try to work to develop a, a very focused list of possible actions for each approach that can be included in the framework. The goal is to include actions that can truly be considered because, as we now know, deliberations should lead me people to make choices. Here, we see three possible actions related to approach one. Next to each action, you also see a corresponding consequence to consider. In other words, if we take this action, what might it cost us, what might we have to give up, or what may, might be a possible negative outcome? When making decisions, we have to keep these things in mind. In the case of the first action, which is implement zero tolerance policies, the Matthew Center worked with our naming and framing participants to identify the possible consequence. As you can see, they identified that the consequence of such policies might be pushing students out of school. When making decisions together, we have to consider such difficult trade-offs before committing to a certain action. Let's work to further explore these ideas with approach two. Here, we have our second approach. Similar to our last slide, we have a few possible actions that were listed for this approach, but our consequences column is blank. We'd like to hand it over to you for a moment. Can you think of a possible consequence to consider for the first action listed? Take a moment to submit your thoughts in the chat box over the next few minutes, or over the next minute or so. Okay, we've received some great responses thus far. Problem of buy-in by students may take time. Hierarchy of bullying may appear with some being more permissible than others. Let's do this same activity now for the second action that's focused on implementing self-confidence training. What might be a possible consequence or cost or trade-off that we may need to consider for our second action? So we've received a few great responses on this, including misunderstanding of how actions work, adults need to maintain the confidentiality of the reporting, reporting may be viewed as bullying by the bullies, wonderful. Now, finally, let's do the same for our third action, which focuses on peaceful solutions and peer mediation program, programs. Take a moment and see if you can't identify a possible consequence to consider for this particular action. Additional cost for the program, length of time that it might take, could be too little, too late in some cases. 
These are really great responses. Solutions may not be viewed as effective in practice. Thank you so much for contributing. So let's now look at the consequences that we identified and compare them to some of the consequ potential consequences that you all listed. So here we've listed out what we included in our framework. Looks like we have some similarities as well as some new ideas. With that in mind, it's important to note that there are many, many trade-offs associated with any action. So there's usually no definitively right or wrong answer. Overall, what we want to ensure is that the actions are realistic and reflect the public's perspective, and we want to ensure that each corresponding consequence highlights a real cost, trade-off, and or outcome that will need to be considered if the action is taken. You'll want to identify actions and possible consequences for each approach, which may take a while. In some cases, you might want to develop a long list of actions and consequences during the workshop and work to refine the list in smaller follow-up workshops. After framing the approaches, listing possible actions, and crafting corresponding consequences to consider, it's important to author a description of each approach for your framework. In some cases, you may want to write a description that spans several pages, similar to National Issues Forum's issue books. In other cases, you may want to develop a brief, concise paragraph for each approach. Both formats can be very effective. It's up to you to decide which makes the most sense for your work. Consider the amount of time that forum participants will have with the resource before or during the deliberation. The more time, the more text you may want to include. The less time, the more concise you'll need to be. As you develop the descriptions for each approach, keep the following points in mind. Your descriptions for each approach should use action-oriented language, convey a tone motivated by what citizens care about and what they hold valuable, and look to answer the problem statement and or question in the title. Let's look at an example from the Bullying Issue book. For approach one, which was entitled Get Tough on Bullying, the Matthew Center developed the following short paragraph description. I'll read it aloud. Reports of bullying incidents are reaching epidemic proportions. Bullying is unacceptable. It must be treated with zero tolerance. Increased reports of bullying in our schools demand that schools, principals, and school districts do more to prevent and provide tougher consequences for bullying. We must ensure that district anti-harassment policies and student codes of conduct in Alabama are strictly enforced. Although it's short, the paragraph uses action-oriented language, conveys a tone motivated by what citizens hold valuable, and looks to answer the problem statement slash question in the title. Similar paragraphs exist for approaches two and three. Once again, the length of the approach descriptions will depend on a variety of factors. It's up to you to decide what's most appropriate. Robert Turner, the David Matthews Center for Civic Life's Assistant Program Director. Over the course of the next few slides, he will explore the final stages of framing. Thanks, Chris. We will now explore the final few steps associated with the practices of naming and framing. Step six, test the framework. In doing this type of work, it is incumbent on the persons involved to hold test forms looking for areas of confusion or things that forum participants note are missing from the framework. Here you will want to let the participants know that you are testing the framework and that the group is planning to revise as necessary so that they will know their work is meaningful and educational. While testing the framework, please consider posing the following questions. Do the approaches answer the question or problem in the name? Do the approaches focus on what people hold valuable? Are the approaches equally weighted and all presented, quote, best foot forward? Are the actions and consequences balanced? Are they relevant to participants? Step seven, use the framework. After testing, we can now use the framework the key here is getting it out to the community. Since you have tested the framework, you know that it is beneficial. Now it is important to spread the framework to those whom you believe it is valuable. In doing this, you should find relevant conveners, utilize and build partnerships 
on all levels, including local, state, and national. On this slide, we share a few links. I'm sorry, on this slide, we share a few types of webinars that highlight strategies to moderate and convening public forums. You may want to use additional research resources in your forum, but always remember the framework is the tool used to prompt deliberation. Now let us review the types of webinars available at www.programminglibrarian.org. They have web four webinars on hosting a public forum. They have one webinar on guiding for on guides for community discussions. And they have two webinars on naming and framing public issues. Again, these can all be found at www.programminglibrarian.org. Examples of naming and framing resource. Now I will share stories through photos of one day extended and on the fly naming and framing processes that we at the David Matthews Center for Civic Life have completed. As we noted at the beginning of the webinar, naming and framing can be done in many different venues as well as in several different ways. It is also relative to the number of people and the subject matter. The photos on this slide are of workshops in the state of Alabama. Some were night meetings, others multi-day workshops or were done on the fly. The first photo is of Project C. This involved months of meetings with the purpose of naming and framing a public issue in regard to the civil rights movement and racial inequality and how those issues are transferable in addressing problems we see today. It required several weeks of planning, which included staff time, travel, and much more. The second photo is of Students Institute. This was done with middle school students, and compared to our other events, this was planned on the fly but provided young students an opportunity to be introduced and immersed in the practice of public deliberation centered around an issue that they care about. The third photo is of an event sponsored by AL.com Media Group. This was a multi-hour forum done on prison reform in the state of Alabama, which involves several community leaders and policymakers. The fourth and final photo at the bottom right is a Civic Institute. It was a two-day experience which focused on early childhood development. Leaders and experts met at the American Village in Montevallo, Alabama to deliberate, name, and frame this important issue to our state and nation. What these photos show is the result of the allocation of resources. Things change depending on the availability of resources, whether you have an on-the-fly, multi-hour, or extended process larger depends on your resources such as staff, availability, space, the location of participants, reimbursements, and much more. Further naming and framing resources. For additional resources, we list three major nonprofit organizations who do research on naming and framing. They all provide free strategies and tools which can help you with the important work of naming and framing. First is the Kettering Foundation that can be found at www.kettering.org. Next is the Public Agenda that can be found at www.publicagenda.org. And last, National Deliberation for Dialogue. They can be found at www.ncdd.org. Now I hand it back over to Nancy to help lead us to our conclusion. Thanks, Robert. We're going to stop here and turn over the discussion to you. We'll answer your questions and talk more about the topics of most interest to you. So I also want to um, uh, thank you all for listening and give you our contact information. I see these slides are sort of going up and down here. That looks better. Um, 
um, and also links to additional resources. So now I'm going to turn over the question session to Sarah Osman, um, and she'll help us work through questions. I see some of you are already typing. So Sarah. Thanks, Nancy, and that was a great presentation. Thank you, everybody. While you are typing your questions into the question box, um, I also want to let you know that if you want to ask me a question privately, I will raise it to the group. Just hover your cursor over my name, Sarah Osman, under Hosts, and you can click uh, Start Private Chat. And you can send me a question that way. I just wanted to start us off with a question that was asked earlier while Chris was speaking. Sarah Go asked, are you determining the thing held valuable at the naming and framing session with the input of the participants, or do you determine this looking for the commonalities on your own? And I will let Chris answer that if that works. Absolutely, and that, and that was a great question. Um, you certainly want to work with um, the citizens who are, helping, who are helping you to name and frame or who are actually naming and framing uh, the issue of concern. You want to work with them to identify the thing held valuable. And so often what we do is, uh, similar to the exercises that we participated in earlier, we would ask the group to cluster concerns according to the thing commonly held valuable, and we would ask the group to work to identify that thing as we begin to cluster. We certainly don't want to impose our perspective as facilitators, um, but we, we don't want to impose our perspective on the participants. We want to give them the opportunity to think creatively together and to work to uncover common ground throughout this process and to recognize what they commonly care about. So it's very important to ask questions as you begin to cluster and to get the group to see if they can't identify what they commonly care about or the thing that they commonly hold valuable. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I have another question here. You touched a little bit on how fiscal spaces are important for a naming and framing effort to be successful. Can you give some more examples that work really well? Hey, this is Nancy. I'll jump in here because uh, I covered this in the last webinar, and I see people have been asking about whether or not the slides are going to be available. Yes, the slides and the webinars will be available um, posted on our site, so we'll make them all available to you. Uh, so what we talked about last time, uh, when we had a whole section on space, was looking for places in your community that people feel welcome and comfortable, but that are also neutral that uh, they will feel that their ideas and perspectives will be weighed equally with others. So the kinds of spaces we talk about, of course, libraries, um, centers like the, Chris Matthew, uh, the uh, David Matthews Center. Um, you saw in the pictures that Robert showed you, the space in the David Matthews Center, the space that had the pillars around it, wonderful physical space for bringing people together in a comfortable, neutral way. Um, other kinds of places in your community, uh, centers, uh, senior centers, other kinds of community centers. Churches are often a good place. But I think it's really important that we realize that often we have to ask, who's not going to participate unless we work really hard to find spaces in their part of the community? So think about that. The people who don't ordinarily participate, where do they spend time? Where do they feel comfortable? The places you want to go. So thanks, Sarah. Sure, that's a great answer. Uh, Gail has a question in the chat box, which is, do you have recommendations for sources of active listening training for facilitators? And is that a, is that a question that you want to jump in on here? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, actively listening, as we talked about early, earlier, is definitely one of the most important roles of a facilitator in any naming and framing session. Um, before you facilitate a naming and framing session, I would definitely recommend seeking out um, a naming and framing session hosted by someone else and really just observing, listening to how they ask questions. If you've ever been through moderator um, development training, through the National Issues Forums or Kettering, um, the Matthews Center, 
does a lot of moderator development workshops. We have a wonderful moderator um, development handbook that's been adapted from the West Virginia Center for Civic Life's um, handbook on our website at matthewcenter.org slash resources. That has wonderful tips for asking good questions and also how to um, use active listening and really think through how what you, what you say, um, how participants might perceive that. So that would be a great resource as well. I would bet that the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation at ncdd.org would have some wonderful resources as well on active listening, for sure. But I think the best way to really develop strong active listening skills is to practice and to, to really step back um, and, and then, then ask questions, for sure. Thanks, Kristen. We have a couple of questions here from Lee, and it sounds like Carolyn is ready to jump in and answer them. Carolyn, I don't know if you want to answer all three. Perhaps we could start with what is the best way to engage leaders or collaborations of community leaders to get them to the table? In a way, I think they're all related. Um, what I've done with uh, leaders is kind of point out the futility of going at it the way we've been going at it. Hammer and tongs, deadlock. Uh, we used an image of two goats butting heads. And, and so much of what goes on in uh, civic life these days looks like that. So that's why we cast this, is a different approach. And I just go over that with political officials and community leaders. We need a different way of doing it. And this is, in fact, a proven way of getting out of deadlock. Um, in terms of inviting people, what I've found works better than anything is a heartfelt personal invitation. You can, you know, plaster the community with, with fires and that's great. But getting on the phone and working your contacts and then getting your contacts to work their contacts and so on in an ever increasing network is, is a way to reach below the usual suspects. Uh, and in fact, when, when you know how you'll have a person who's become the spokesperson for a particular group in a community? And, and you can say, you know, I know you're really busy. I know that everybody wants a piece of your time. Who could you send us for your group so that we don't add one more thing to your plate? And that way you, you, you get a fresh perspective instead of somebody who's just run every which way. And um, in terms of when it all goes wrong, well, I was telling you about the redevelopment thing. We had a uh, political party that shall remain nameless decide that this, was, this uh, naming and framing was a misuse of the taxpayers' money and put a public referendum out to make a stop. And um, fortunately, it was an advisory referendum. And we didn't stop. And the results have been very, very useful. And the community in general has bought into it. And sometimes you just, you just have to keep trudging along it, and, and believe that the process works. The process will unite the community in term. Um, did I get it all? I think you did. Thank you, Carolyn. We have another budget question here. Should an organizer of such an act to need a budget, or can it be accomplished at no expense? Great question for Robert.
Great, thanks Robert. Carl asked a question about who you want sitting around the table in these discussions. He says, are you really looking for leaders in these discussions, people who already seem to know what is needed, or are you looking for people who have opinions but no one ever asks? Uh, I'll take this question. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Nancy, did you want to? No, oh, Chris, you go ahead. Great. Thank you. I, I love this question. I think it's very important. We want to try to bring in as many different voices from the community as possible. We don't just, uh, and when working to name and frame in public terms, you don't just want the same group of folks who are always around the table uh, engaging in this kind of pra in these practices. You want to bring in the voices, as you stated, as as the uh, participant who stated this question said, you want to bring in the voices of the folks who feel like they've maybe not been asked to be involved in the past. We want to bring people from the sideline, off the sidelines and bring them into this particular series of democratic practices and let them know that their perspective is valued, that their opinion is valued, and that they will get the opportunity to share those opinions and perspectives with others while actively listening to the ideas and perspectives of folks in their community that they've maybe not gotten a chance to sit down with before. And so you don't just want policymakers in the room, you don't just want um, the, the folks who are considered uh, the movers and shakers of the community in the room. You do want those voices there, but you also want the voices of folks in the community who may have some very real opinions and thoughts about the, about the issue being discussed, but maybe they aren't always invited to sit at the table with everyone else. And, and Carolyn just made a great point of working to provide child care and food to get people out so that you can overcome barriers. And I want to connect that back to the point Robert was making in terms of finding folks who have space that they can that they can provide for the naming and framing workshop. Finding folks to partner with who can provide flip charts. Finding folks in the community who might be willing to donate food or donate childcare. Um, you know, there are people in communities all across the country who are willing to to chip in and help and, and and work to make a collective impact, as Robert said a moment ago. And if not, as Carolyn stated, there there may be a budget that's needed. But thinking through the, these these very important questions. Um, will help us get that much closer to getting a lot of folks around the table and really working to name and frame in public terms. I want to uh, emphasize on and add on to what Chris said, and then we probably will need to, um, to wrap up today. And that is, what's so exciting about this work is it taps into the general public. It is not about experts sitting around. So many of us are used to going to events where the expert talks and we listen. This is a chance for citizens, for people, to act like citizens, that they can participate in making choices together. And that's what's so exciting about all this. So what we hope will happen in your community, as it has in our communities, is that we're going to see people that haven't participated before. Because it's, it's not just about listening and hearing what your neighbor has to say. It's also about contributing to a sense that democracy is about all of us and letting people know that when their ideas and their thoughts are actually valued, that there is a welcome opportunity for them to be a participant in our democracy. So I'm going to wrap up now um, and thank everybody again. Um, Remember, you can tune into this first webinar that we held, which is archived on the ALA public programming site. Um, and we also have an ALA Connect site at the bottom that has all of the resources. It will have the PowerPoints from this and the other and links to uh, the archives for all of the uh, webinars we've been doing. Um, in addition, we are looking to host a Hangout early in the new year. So we can share experiences with participants who jumped in or are planning to jump in to actually um, taking, uh, g going forward with a naming and framing initi initiative. So I want to close by thanking all of our participants for joining us today, the ALA Program Office, for your assistance in producing the webinar, our colleagues at the David Matthews Center who have worked diligently with us virtually for months to plan this program, and my colleagues at the ALA Center for Civic Life for their unwavering commitment to promoting public engagement through libraries. So thanks, everyone, for joining us to get today. And we we'll hope you see, to see you on future webinars.